Hi, welcome to Living with Sjogren's Disease. My name is Vicki. Uh, you can find me on Instagram and Facebook as Sjogren's Trooper. This, I'm also Sjogren's Trooper and Vicki on the channel Living with Sjogren's Syndrome. Today's video is about Sjogren's medications that I've tried in the past and what I'm currently taking. Let's see. I'm going to try real hard to stick to the topic here. Um, my purpose, I'm, I've made note cards for myself because very easily I can veer off track and end up all over the place. So that's why I'm using cards. I want to re make sure that I give the right information at the right time. And my purpose for this video today is yes, to create awareness about Sjogren's Syndrome and share my journey with others um, in hopes of encouraging other people and sharing what's worked for me and what hasn't. Because often what works for one person doesn't work for another. So quite often we end up trying several different um, coping strategies and different medications or different med combinations, whether it's prescribed meds or over-the-counter. Um, people living with Sjogren's Syndrome or any autoimmune disease often go through quite a battle to figure out what works for their body and what doesn't. Just getting diagnosed is a battle. So that is why um, I am making today's video. Um, so what is Sjogren's syndrome? It is an autoimmune disease, meaning your immune system, something goes awry and the white blood cells start to attack self. In Sjogren's syndrome, white blood cells will attack the moisture secreting glands. And we have moisture secreting glands throughout our body. They're in our eyes, our mouth, our lungs, like our entire digestive system, our skin. Um, now, Sjogren's disease can be classified in two ways. One, it can be primary, <clears throat> which means it's the major main thing you've been diagnosed with. Or secondary, meaning you already have been diagnosed with an autoimmune disorder or disease, and then Sjogren's came into the picture. Primary Sjogren's tends to, um, it can be more involved as far as the body systemically. And in either type can become severe, uh, can cross over into the brain, into the nervous system, can cross into your lungs, it can attack your heart, your liver, your kidneys, your pancreas, your bladder, um, your skin, your nerves, um, can cause depression, anxiety. Uh, a lot, I think, mainly because of all the difficulty, all the issues that we deal with. Um, can be very depressing and anxiety provoking. But I do believe that Sjogren's syndrome is also a major cause of depression on its own as it attacks the brain. The brain can develop areas of inflammation. And those can show up on MRI as areas of hyper opacities. Um, and if you have several or even just more than one, um, it can be necessary for you to see a multiple sclerosis neurologist, a neurologist who specializes in multiple sclerosis in order to distinguish as to whether your, those areas that show up on MRI, those areas of hyperopacity, as to whether those are from multiple sclerosis or related to Sjogren's syndrome disease. 
Um, so it can be quite involved. Therefore, there can be a lot of medications. And so I'm going to talk about medications today that I have taken and either stopped or am taking now. I will tell you why I was prescribed them, why I stopped them, and why I'm taking what I'm taking right now and why. I'll also tell you the other meds that I'm taking because basically all my medications are related to Sjogren's syndrome complications. I'll also tell you about the supplements that I take and some that I've taken in the past that I've stopped. So let's get started with that. Oh, by the way, that's Norschwanstein Castle behind me. It's a picture that we have up on our wall in our bedroom. I'm on the bed to film today because it's a really cozy place and I really enjoy the castle behind me. Um, so that's what that is. <laughs> okay, now originally I wanted to start a series of videos about my Sjogren's journey as a follow-up to the video that um, I previously posted at the beginning of summer about my Sjogren's Syndrome story. And um, I decided I had wanted to start with causes, possible causes and theories about that, and then move into symptoms and history of symptoms that we often can have but don't know what it is, uh, and then talk about medications. But a few people have uh, mentioned medications and asked um, about the meds that I'm taking for Sjogren's. And so I felt that it was important to first start with medications. Um, very important. So that's why I'm starting with meds. Uh, the other videos will follow in this, in this series. So there should be at least three videos. There may be four or five, depending on the interest. And um, if I have something enough information that I can back up with um, studies and verifiable material, either on the internet or in books and that sort of thing. So medications. The meds that I've taken in the past um, and now um, are... Let's see. Okay, prednisone. In the beginning, when first diagnosed, I took a prednisone taper, starting from 20 milligrams and going down to, to one and then off. And that was to calm down my immune system. At that time, I also began a regimen of Plaquenil, 400 milligrams every morning. Now, it's up to you whether you take your Plaquenil in the morning or at night, or you break it up into two separate doses. Uh, the tablets, I believe mine came in 200 milligram tablets. So I took two tablets every morning. And uh, I didn't notice much. Uh, I don't believe I noticed much side effects from it or stomach issue, most likely because I already had so much tummy trouble and gut trouble. Um, the main issue with Plaquenil that I had was the intense itching. It was so bad. Um, I would just itch. Um, but if I had clothing, tight clothing, um, like leggings or a tight, um, knit sweater top or a shirt, something like that, it, it wouldn't feel very bad. I, I wouldn't notice it as much, especially if I, my mind was busy and preoccupied. However, after showering, immediately after showering, I would get intensive itching that was painful and felt like a million fire ants biting all over me all at once. And the more I itched, the more on fire I was. So I developed ways of coping with that, changing my um my body wash to 
whatever I could find that had the least amount of chemicals, um, the least amount of issues, things that were for sensitive skin. Uh, eventually, I reached a point where I couldn't wash my legs and scrub my arms in the shower. Um, I would just let whatever I was washing the rest of my body, wa body wash down over me. And uh, then, then I would take a bath at least twice a week in addition to the regular showering and soak to get the dead skin off because my skin is so dry. It's always been so dry. And um, so that's what I would do. And I would put emollients in the bath water, um, cocoa, coconut oil. I would put in my bath water. I would put in Epsom salts and it would make the water as, as hot as I could without it causing worse dry skin. And then I would soak. And then after soaking, I would just normally wash. Um, there were times when I shaved my legs because that would really take off the dry skin. However, I didn't need to shave my legs because um, hair growth was very stunted. That could have been partially from Plaquenil, but I had already had that going on previous to being on Plaquenil, which may or may not have be related. Um, but then that dovetails into symptoms, which will be covered in a subsequent video. Um, so eventually I had to stop the um, Plaquenil, although I took it for many years, 20 plus, before it started causing any kind of um, damage to my retina. And at the point where we noticed that was at least a year, probably a year and a half ago, um, maybe two years. I, I'm i not certain, but not farther than two years ago. Uh, what happened was I had an event in my right eye uh, that turned out to be a little bit of the retina pulling away, not as a detachment, just something that happens as we age. And while doing all the imaging for that, the ophthalmologist did note <clears throat> very early mild changes. And so she had me stop Plaquenil at that time. And I have continued to follow up with her uh, once every three months. Now it's just once every six months. And so far there has been no further change, no further damage. I was told that once you stop the Plaquenil, it is possible that you can continue to have more damage occurring um, because the Plaquenil is still in your system and it takes time for it to metabolize and completely work its way out of your system. But as a huge blessing, um, my eye damage that was noticed has not progressed. So um, that's my deal with Plaquenil. Uh, the other techniques that I used to deal with the itching, which were a huge benefit because the itching was so bad, I purchased long, narrow ice packs, the jelly kind that you just put in the freezer. And I would put one over each leg and each arm. I had to use two over my legs, uh, one for upper and one for lower. So four for my legs and two, one each for my arm. So six long ice packs. It's a lot. It takes up space in your freezer, yes. Uh, but if you're on Plaquenil and you have itching, oh my gosh, that ice, if you can tolerate the ice on your skin, it will calm your itching down like that. And I would lay here on the bed like that for probably a good, 15 to 20 minutes and then boom, it'd be gone. I'd be fine. So, um, I highly recommend the ice packs. Just, just saying it, it made a big difference and, um, I needed it to the very day I stopped taking Plaquenil. So I, I and the, and after that, I haven't had that itching happen.
since then. So I can rub my skin to get the dead skin off. You know, highly recommend the ice packs. I highly recommend coconut oil. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that brings us to methotrexate. I began methotrexate for about seven months in 2012 after I had an event in my left eye that um, affected my optic nerve and that resulted in 55% nerve damage, thus 55% vision loss. And so at that time, I was recommended to see the MS neurologist um, who monitored me for at least two years, declared that I do not have MS, that it's all related to Sjogren's, but also at the same time, I then was started on methotrexate. Uh, 0 0.8 cc's, which is 0 0.8 on an, a one cc insulin syringe. That equals 20 milligrams. And that was just once a week, a once a week injection uh, I was only able to tolerate seven months of the methotrexate because of the side effects. It did make me feel nauseous. I couldn't ride in the truck. I did use the sublingual Zofran. Didn't work for me. And I was very fatigued, even worse than the Sjogren's, you know, fatigue. My family at the time, uh, some of my family members, not all, but some of them at the time strongly urged me to get off of it because they could see what was happening. And I was still working full time um, and I would choose to do my injection at night at bedtime and uh, on a day when I knew I was gonna have the next day off. I had a very, ver I had a variable work schedule. And so that was kind of tricky, but that only lasted seven months. No. Correction, it only lasted seven weeks, seven doses, and that that was it. Um, now, when I talked to my rheumatologist about the methotrexate, how I felt about it, um, at that time, my rheumatologist had made a statement um, that he didn't really know what else he could do if I didn't want the best medicine out there. And I felt very intimidated by that. I was upset because I knew there were other medications that I could be given that, that could at least be tried to see if they were helpful, that were, were not so hard on me. And um, I felt so intimidated that I didn't go back. I looked for another rheumatologist in my area. I did find one. And she then started me on Imuran. And I didn't have any side effects from that at all. It wasn't subcutaneous. Like I didn't do an injection. It was a pill. I didn't feel nauseous from it. I did very well on that until um, labs showed that my white blood cells were getting too low. And at that point, we had to stop the Imuran. And so at that point, I was just on Plaquenil. And there began my downfall, my major decline. Uh, yeah, just a little bit seemed like every month I'd feel worse. And it was very up and down, hills and valleys, all the different symptoms. Uh, so um, I tried a rheumatologist uh, about five to six hours away, the one that my daughter sees. And that didn't go well either because even though I had sent over, made sure that my history, my diagnosis history, my med history had been sent over, it didn't seem to me that he had even looked at any of it before seeing me. I don't even think he read it. And um, after explaining to this rheumatologist my story and what was going on. He said to me, I don't even think you have Sjogren's syndrome. I think what you have, 
I think you just have fibromyalgia. And I wanted to scream. I wanted to scream because I did have fibromyalgia in addition to the many other issues I've had because of my Sjogren's disease, which I was diagnosed with already by lip biopsy and labs, right? And history. So that didn't get me anywhere. So what happened is that I continued to get worse. Uh, and in my denial, I thought, maybe I'm just on too many meds. I take way too many meds. And I was listening to other voices as well. Not in my head. <laughs> listening to other voices about medications and natural remedies and um, other friends um, telling me, you just take too many medications, you just need better sleep, you just need A, B, C, X, Y, Z. Um, and so I went off of my Plaquenil and no longer the rheumatologist that I had seen here in my, my own county, the second one, um, was no longer available because she had moved to the VA. And eventually, over about six months, I eventually just crashed. I was so miserable physically, mentally, I couldn't even do my job. Uh, and I had somewhat of what I would say a mini meltdown, emotional breakdown, um, it felt kind of like a nervous breakdown. And so at that point, I went back to my original uh, rheumatologist, humbled myself that whole six months. It really humbled me. I went back. I went back on prednisone. I really, my labs were flaring really bad and everything was just, everything was just awful. So I went back on prednisone starting at, I don't know if it was a 30 milligram dose or a 20 milligram dose and stayed at that for about four weeks because prednisone depletes dopamine in the brain. I didn't do very well on a long-term dose like that. So I ended up needing medication increase, which definitely helped. Uh, for mental health medication. Um, it didn't do anything to increase dopamine, but it did help me cope without constantly having mood swings. Um, I went back on the Plaquenil at that time and restarted methotrexate. So that was a really difficult period of time. Um, so methotrexate has played a really big role in, and prednisone has also played a big role in calming down my immune system and keeping it calmed down. Uh, and I did okay on the methotrexate because I was determined, not because I wasn't sick, not because it didn't make me feel icky, but because I was determined and because my eyes were opened and, um, I knew that I needed some help medication wise that I wasn't um, handling it well on my own. So prednisone, Plaquenil, methotrexate, Imuran, um, those all played a huge role. Uh, the prednisone eventually was weaned down to 10 milligrams then over time, weaned down to five. And I have been on five milligrams every day since then. So it's been five years. I have tried to go off of the wean off of the prednisone. It does not work out for me. I wish I could, but it is a very low dose. And, um, you know, it helps me. It just helps me. 
Um, there is a period of time when I went off the methotrexate during 2022, over this past year. And I went downhill again. During that time, I tried dietary. I made major dietary changes. And still, my immune system flared. Only maybe half as bad, though, but I was still pretty miserable. And my inflammation was just too high. So I did go back to the methotrexate. And there are some different um, changes that I have made along the way that have made it easier. So number one, the Zofran for the nausea. I no longer take the sublingual. I don't have any saliva. <laughs> Why they would give me sublingual in the first place, I don't know. How is it supposed to dissolve if you don't have saliva in your mouth? Even now, I I have cotton mouth. I really need to take a drink of fluids. But um, finally, you know, and then I would, after like seven to ten minutes of it not dissolving and it just sticking there under my tongue and tasting bad, I would take a teeny sip of water and try to get it to dissolve a little more. But that doesn't cause it to absorb. And so um, it just never worked. It didn't work to do anything for my nausea. I would end up taking half of a Benadryl. Benadryl, 25 milligrams, half, 12.5. Um, and the Benadryls, they're not scored. The Benadryl tablets that I take, they're not scored. So you really don't know exactly how much Benadryl you're actually getting when you break it in half, unless it's scored. Unless a tablet is scored, you cannot be certain that all of the medication is evenly, equally distributed within the tablet. But I still just break it in half and take it and just, it's better than not taking it. And that does help. Um, but I, let my provider know, my rheumatologist, and right away they put in a prescription for the oral kind that you swallow. And oh my gosh, what a difference that made. Listen, if you are on methotrexate and you um, have nausea from it and you are trying to use that sublingual Zofran, mm -mm. try the oral one ask for oral it made all the difference for me and now i now i see that that zofran wasn't absorbing sublingually it just it wasn't getting into my system but it is now and it's it's a huge game changer for me um so the methotrexate i give it in my leg um somewhere between my knee and my hip it makes a big difference. I was using the fattier tissue in, you know, my posterior hip, which isn't quite the gluteus, isn't quite my, my keister, but it's not my ab or my hip either. It's just back there, right? And I tried my lower abdominal. Uh, that doesn't work out either because of the way it absorbs. When I give it in my leg, it takes a good 24 hours to fully absorb. So the next day, I take my shot at bedtime, and the next day, I, I feel great. <laughs> like the very next day, this round, this time around with methotrexate, I feel great the next day. Um, it's the following day, the second day out, that the fatigue and the headache and the ickiness hits. I'm still able to do a few things. I can get myself some food. I can do a load of dishes, uh, maybe once or twice up and down the stairs if I need to, but definitely not go anywhere. Usually by one o'clock, I forget it. You know, if I wake up at 7.30 or eight and get up by one o'clock, forget it. I'm just three sheets to the wind. Um, and then, the following day out, and, and I, that's when I need to take that Zofran, and it definitely helps. 
the following day out, which would be today, the third day out, I feel pretty good. I don't feel energized as much as I did right the day after, but I definitely feel better than I did second day out, which for me is yesterday. Um, I do have bruising, but I'm also taking doses of ibuprofen right now because the Tylenol isn't cutting it and that makes me sleepy. So I take that at night, but right now I'm having neck and shoulder pain and spasming, spasming which is greatly decreased. But the reason it started in the first place was from the pneumonia vaccine. So if you are getting your pneumonia vaccine, plan it for a time when you don't have holidays to get ready for. <laughs> I did not know that it would affect me this way. I have had it once before, and I do not remember having awful pain like this. No. Um, so I don't think this would, occurs with everybody. But just to be on the safe side, just, just as advice from somebody who's been there and had it, don't go get it a few days before Thanksgiving or Christmas or your birthday or any celebration because you may just have some difficulty and need time to heal. So um, other medications that I take, well, all of my medications are basically related to my Sjogren's disease. I take omeprazole. 20 milligrams a day. I've taken it probably since 2008. And three times I've tried to go off of it. And every single time, my digestive system just revolts against me. It's hard to swallow. Food doesn't go down. Um, reflux comes back up. And um, I have gone off of it for almost 30 days. And in that time, watch my diet very closely and carefully um, so that my diet isn't what's causing those issues. And all three times consistently, no matter what I do to manage it, it, it always comes back with a vengeance, this awful difficulty. And so um, I'm saying on the omeprazole, I think it was summertime this past summer 2022 that I tried to go off of it again. So my life has more um, quality to it when I stay on the medication. I do believe omeprazole does have side effects. Um, and I do know at least a couple people who have chosen not to take it and who just deal with the issue because of the side effects were so bad. For me, thankfully, I don't notice side effects, but that also could be because of side effects of other medications like prednisone and methotrexate and some of the mental health meds that I take. So um, I also take Let's see, the mental health stuff. Let's talk about that. I've been on various SSRIs for almost 20 years, um, and that is directly related to my Sjogren's, um, in part because coping with it is really hard, um, but also because it's attacked my brain, my central nervous system. And so, Meds that I've taken for depression, anxiety, inability to focus, and brain fog are Prozac, didn't work for me, got really sick from it, GI sick, and that was way before omeprazole entered, entered into the picture. Paxil just wasn't effective. Zoloft was, in, was effective for quite a long time, uh, but then just gradually stopped working over a few weeks. And that's when my doc started me on escitalopram, worked for a long time. Uh, but then as my Sjogren's worsened, 
and life difficulties worsened, um, it just ended up not being enough. And I was already at the highest dose. So that's when Wellbutrin, um, I can't remember also the other name for Wellbutrin, but that's when they started Wellbutrin. And over time, it just ended up being too much. Um, the side effects were too much and my anxiety increased really bad. And I, I think that Wellbutrin had a lot to do, that extra medication had a lot to do with my nervous breakdown. I don't know if I had a true nervous breakdown. I didn't lose touch with who I am in reality, but I definitely crawled into myself. I stayed off of social media. I wouldn't answer any friends' phone calls or texts to see how I was. I couldn't handle being in the living room with the drapes or blinds up. I just, I, something was really wrong. And um, I decided this could be too much serotonin in my brain, which I only was aware of due to working in nursing in mental health for so many years, was aware that that could happen. So I weaned off of Wellbutrin and I weaned down uh, from my escitalopram down to 10 milligrams and stayed at that. Uh, eventually, my doctor put me, changed my medication altogether to duloxetine. And like Wellbutrin, the duloxetine also has side effects that aren't fun to put up with. Um, but I stuck with it because I knew that I needed it, that my brain needed healing and that I needed something. Even if that wasn't just the right, perfect medication for me, I needed something. Um, I wasn't working at that point. I was just home taking care of myself. Okay, that um, concludes part one. The video was far too long. And I did have to break it up into two parts. So I'll see you in part two. And we will finish talking about the medications and the supplements as well.